Welcome back, everyone. We're going to jump straight into the next session, Natural Gas Delivery Leadership on Emissions Reductions. What are companies doing to reduce emissions? Where are the opportunities? Where are the obstacles? We have a terrific lineup of speakers. Our moderator for this session is Jennifer Nicholson, a member of the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Prior to joining the board and the world of regulation in 2018, Jennifer worked in the private sector in a variety of senior executive positions in the energy, mining, consultancy, and finance sectors. Jennifer, take it away. Thanks so much, Monica. I'm really excited to be here today. And we have a great lineup of panelists today. We're going to start with uh, some presentations from each of them on their roles and what's going on with their companies in this space. Then uh, I will ask them a number of questions and we'll take questions from the audience to round out our time. And we have about an hour. So our first speaker is Malina Gerdahar, who is the Vice President of Business Development and Regulatory for Enbridge Gas in Toronto. Her accountabilities include regulatory affairs, public affairs, business development, and energy conservation programs. She is also accountable for energy transition and strategic planning, compliance with federal carbon change legislation, and the advancement of lower carbon technologies and solutions for Enbridge's customers. Malina is a chartered financial analyst and has a graduate degree in economics. And this is pretty impressive. In 2019, Malini was awarded a spot on the Women's Executive Network's top 100 list of Canada's top um, most powerful women. So take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, what I thought I might do very quickly is just talk a little bit about Enbridge um, and what we're doing in this space, um, specifically the gas utility and then some thoughts on the role we can play uh, in a net zero, net zero future. So um, quite simply, Enbridge uh, is North America's um, largest energy infrastructure company. Uh, the name Enbridge you know, was conceived about more than 20 years ago to denote a energy bridge between uh, a producing region and a consuming region or you know whether it was crude oil to refineries or natural gas um, to consuming markets but today we think of enbridge as an energy bridge to the future uh, and in fact have thought so for a while uh, and, uh, and that has resulted in us taking an, in, uh, an increasing role in renewable energy specifically um, solar to some extent, but largely wind and increasing the offshore wind is an area of interest uh, for the company. Uh, what I'd like to um, dwell on today, though, is the gas utility business, uh, which serves the province of Ontario and a, a small franchise in Quebec. And uh, we really, you know, we distribute 30% of Ontario's energy um, in the form of natural gas and connect 3.8 million customers and 75% of all Ontario households. Um, use the energy that we deliver. So, you know, we, we do believe we have an important role to play in not just delivering affordable and reliable energy, but also increasingly with a lower carbon footprint. So with that, you know, the, the main point I do want to make is that regulated utilities are critical to reaching net zero by 2050. Um, largely because of the role we play currently in terms of delivering energy affordably and reliably, but also because the reach of our assets and the reach to our customers allows us to play a very important market facilitation role and to provide creative solutions that engage governments, regulators, and industry in doing this. And, uh, you know, it's really evident in one of the things that we've been doing for over 25 years, which is energy conservation. So we've been in the space for a very long time and our utility programs deliver tremendous value to our customers, um, both in the form of making it easier to adopt energy efficient solutions and technologies, um, but also in terms of bringing new and more efficient products to market and then allowing customers to participate by offering incentives and helping them along the way. So whether it's homes or businesses. So we see this as being very important well into the future, particularly with more governments playing in the space through funding 
And, uh, you know, it's certainly in collaboration with our uh, electric counterparts as well. The other area that we play a role in is actually bringing, as I said, clean technology to market. And there's two sectors where we are really keen to do this. One is in transportation and the other one is in heat. So CNG or compressed natural gas has been around for a long time. Uh, increasingly, it is seen as a great solution for heavy duty vehicles where battery technology is unlikely to assist uh, just given the weight issues and uh, you know the ability to carry freight. But CNG and renewable natural gas provide a net zero solution, often even a carbon negative solution uh, to the extent that we take fugitive methane emissions um, away. Um, similarly, in heating, there's a number of technologies that we're very interested in. Uh, CHP provides the ability to be an efficient solution, both for the generation of power and the utilization of heat. Uh, geothermal is a great technology. It's been around for a while, and one of the beauties of geothermal is that you heat or cool, uh, you know, in a way that requires much less peak energy than other solutions. Uh, and that is something that we're interested in both for residential markets as well as for businesses. Uh, and then there's a whole host of hybrid technologies that can utilize the capabilities of our electricity grid as well as our natural gas grid such that we can reduce emissions through the use of renewable power, but also use the natural gas system to provide storage, which it does extremely well and very affordably. Um, so heat pumps, you know, electric heat pumps in combination with natural gas furnaces that can be turned on depending on the price of power and the time of year so that you use the most efficient solution as an example. Natural gas heat pumps are a technology we, we're trying to bring into the market, which right off the bat can give you a 20 to 30 percent emissions reduction relative to the most efficient furnaces that exist today. And then finally, you know, I do want to talk about renewable uh, fuels because the notion that the natural gas infrastructure can transport not just natural gas, but increasingly gas with a lower carbon footprint is a huge enabler in getting us to net zero. So uh, with that, you know, that's just a, a list of the sorts of things we could do and we are doing already, but what is the path forward? So, you know, we know that we have to stop talking in binary terms, in terms of, you know, uh, less of this and more of that, or zero of this and 100% of that, because we know that the path to the future is not a linear path. And it requires all energy systems to work uh, in an integrated fashion. And, uh, you know, to just highlight how interdependent our systems are, you know, we've got some stats here. Natural gas provides two times the energy needs that electricity does at about half the cost, and certainly true in Ontario. Um, and, you know, we had a study done through the CGA that said replacing with electricity, so 100% renewable electrification, would cost Canada almost $600 billion. Uh, and at the end of the day, renewable electricity, because of its intermittent nature, to a large part, you know, instead of hydro, uh, does require um, natural gas backup and other critical processes. Uh, so there is a limit to how much electrification we can do. But on the other hand, we can use the clean, uh, renewable characteristics of uh, electricity with the ability to store uh, that the natural gas infrastructure gives us. So we have to think about how we integrate these two systems together. We also need policy that explicitly considers these energy sources and policies that provide our regulators with the ability to bring environmental objectives into the regulation of how energy is delivered to our customers. So with that, I'm happy to stop speaking and uh, take it up later. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for that uh, great overview of what Enbridge is doing. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Our next speaker is Frederick Krikorian, who's the Vice President, Sustainable Development, Public and Government Affairs for Enagir. Fred has 20 years of experience in public affairs, as well as an expertise in corporate social responsibility with an emphasis in the natural resources and energy sectors. Fred has a master's degree in corporate social responsibility from Nottingham University Business School in the UK. He co-chairs the board of SWITCH, the Alliance for a Green Economy, and sits on several other boards. Take it away, Fred.
Hi, everyone. Jennifer, is there? Does that sound good? Do you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. And your webcam is up now. All good. OK. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you and my colleagues on this panel to discuss the role of utilities in reducing GHG emissions and delivering on the net zero 2050 agenda. First, I'll uh, have a few words about energy to set the stage. So energy is known as being the leading natural gas distribution company in Quebec. But over the last 15 to 20 years, we have grown from a natural gas distributor to a diversified energy company. Um, in the early 2000s, almost all of activities and assets were related to natural gas and over the last we diversified our energy mix. So today, about half of our 8 billion assets are in the gas business and the other half in electricity and renewables as well. This is why in 2017, we've changed our name from Gas Metro to Energie to reflect that evolution. Last year, with new leadership in place, we took a closer look at our gas business in Quebec and its future in a low carbon economy. And we develop our 2030 2050 corporate vision in order to decarbonize our activities and have a resilient and sustainable business model. This vision uh, is to remain relevant to our customers and to keep up with an economy that is moving towards accelerated decarbonization. It's our way to be part of the solution in a context where the main energy company in Quebec, Hydro Quebec, a Crown Corporation is delivering renewable electricity. The strategic vision is based on four, on four uh, orientations, which aim at increasingly decarbonize our natural gas system and position us where and when we can offer added value economically and environmentally for our customers and for society. So the first orientation is to increase our energy efficiency efforts. This is a no brainer. And uh, we were among, if not uh, the first, to put in place energy efficiency program 20 years ago. Uh, and so in the next 10 years, where our, our ambition is to deliver what we've done in the last 20, so 100, uh, 1 million ton in the next 10 years, uh, so uh, we'll double our efforts. The second orientation is to accelerate the injection of RNG in the system. We're targeting at least 10% in that system with what the Quebec's government plan for a green economy uh, is uh, putting forward. The potential of RNG is there. There are several uh, production projects that are coming online. Demand is there as well. And price is competitive uh, with hydroelectricity, especially for institutional customers. And we'll probably have the, the opportunity to discuss that uh, further in the panel. But I think that to fully appreciate the value of RNG, it's important to compare to other renewable alternatives and not just to look at how it compares to fossil and natural gas. The third orientation, which is uh, quite new, is uh, to focus on developing a strong complementary between gas and electricity networks. Melanie referred to the interdependency of networks, and that's what we're thinking about. Hydroelectricity, which is uh, really present in Quebec and other provinces, it's a tremendous asset. Electrifying part of the economy is desirable and it, uh, it can make sense, and we acknowledge that, in some market to switch from gas to uh, electricity. However, there are technical, economical challenge in covering, for instance, gas heating to electricity during winter peak time. So our gas system can serve that peak and at lower cost. This is why we're currently working with uh, Hydro-Quebec, a dual energy solution in order to decarbonize our economy and to do it at the lowest possible cost for society. The idea here is to use the right energy at the right place, at the right time, and the right price. Um, we really want to create an uh, environmental and economical value by leveraging our structure rather than just focusing um, on uh, natural gas volumes that we deliver. As we expect that these volumes uh, that we distribute may remain stable and slightly decrease by 2030 and decrease more sharply by 2050. 
Finally, the fourth uh, orientation is to diversify into sustainable growth vectors, particularly in uh, green hydrogen. We're currently establishing our roadmap on this uh, topic, as well as to position ourselves in the development of energy services and expertise with our clients. With all of these initiatives, we aim at reducing by 30% GHG emissions related to natural gas in buildings by 2030, and uh, we're aiming at being carbon neutral by 2050. As of today, we've identified 70% of the reductions needed to get there. And, our stated, and as stated in our climate report, we believe that with this vision, our business model is resilient in a two degree climate scenario. So there's still work to be done to refine the strategies to get to 2050, but we believe that with this plan, we are on the right track. Great. Finally, a quick word on public policies that um, we have to, to, to deal with in Quebec. So while we were developing our vision, Quebec government climate plan, we also have a new climate plan that was put forward by the city of Montreal. So we believe that we are aligned with these policies, that we can be part of the solution, but facing that, facing also the expectations from society and customers, from our investors as well, we believe that uh, policies and the regulatory framework will need to be aligned to enable us to deliver on this 2050 agenda. Thank you, Jennifer, I pass it on to you. Thanks so much. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Doug Slater, who's the Vice President External and Indigenous Affairs for Fortis BC Energy, Inc. And Doug has more than uh, 10 years of experience with Fortis BC, holding all kinds of different roles. In his current uh, role, he oversees the work needed to deliver on their long-term goal of becoming BC's energy partner of choice while meeting their long-term uh, short-term priorities of enhancing engagement with key stakeholders, responding to evolving policy landscape, and leading the innovation portfolio as uh, Fortis pursues a lower carbon energy future. Uh, one thing I found very interesting about Doug is that he is a registered professional forester, a chartered professional accountant, and a certified human resources professional. Talk about having a uh, a wide variety of skills. <laughs> With that, uh, we'll take it, send it over to you now, Doug. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Uh, just a quick sound check. Can everybody hear me? Or can the moderator hear me? Yep, you sound great. Okay, and good. your web cram is working perfectly. Wonderful. That was, uh, that was more than a feat today. Um, but thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, I'm just going to uh, spin through these slides fairly quickly to, to catch up a bit of time. But uh, I wanted to first start by familiarizing you with Fortis BC and then talking a little bit about our the steps we're taking to address uh, climate uh, action. So um, just a bit about Fortis BC. Uh, we've, um, uh, you know, we are the largest energy provider in the province and we've been in BC in various forms for over 100 years. Today we provide gas and electricity service to more than 1.2 million gas and electric customers across the province. Uh, as you see the map on the bottom right side shows the areas we serve. The blue is our gas service territory and the greeny yellow is our overlapping gas and electric service territory. So a bit more detail, we have four hydroelectric generating plants in the southeast part of BC, uh, about 7,000 kilometers of electric transmission distribution lines, uh, about 50,000 kilometers of natural gas uh, transmission and distribution, a couple of LNG storage facilities, uh, the province's largest, largest underground natural gas storage facility, and uh, five RNG facilities and counting. So um, with that background out of the way, I want to talk a little bit about our, our clean growth pathway and you'll see some very common themes amongst the presenters here today. So this, this um, slide describes our long-term strategy called our clean growth pathway to 2050, which we created in consultation with the uh, BC government as they rolled out uh, their climate action commitment in late 2018 with the Clean BC plan. So our clean growth pathway leverages the decarbonization potential of both our gas and electric energy systems uh, and helps us lead the way to a lower carbon economy. Um, underneath that plan in 2019, we established our first ever emissions reduction goal, which we called 30 by 30. This represents uh, for us a significant public commitment on our journey towards 2050 uh, to reduce customer emissions by 30% by 2030. 
So that would include things uh, up, to, uh, up to and including scope three emissions. And we did that because our emissions are relatively small uh, in scale. So by targeting our customers' emissions, we can create a much bigger impact. So underneath, we identified four key pillars. Um, very simply, energy efficiency is about helping customers use less energy through incentive funding uh, for higher efficiency products, such as furnaces, insulation, et cetera. Um, we have approval from our regulator to triple our investments. And uh, we'll be spending uh, nearly $100 million across both our utilities by 2022. And as a result, we're amongst the largest providers of energy efficiency incentives in Canada. And of course, helping customers use up less energy uh, also contributes significant amount to GHG reductions. Uh, renewable gas and hydrogen, so we were the um, uh, first utility in North America to offer RNG to our residential customers starting in about 2012. And we've since aggressively expanded our supply of RNG are now actively pursuing other low carbon gases like hydrogen and uh, syngas. Um, we aim to increase our supply to 15% by 2030 in line with the provincial clean BC plan and are currently well on our way there. And over the longer term, we envision a future where the vast majority of the energy we deliver being low carbon and renewable. Um, our third pillar is zero and low carbon transportation. So as I mentioned, um, we have an electric utility in the southeast part of BC and we've built a network of approximately 30, 30 charging stations so far uh, and are expecting to have a total of 40 uh, DC fast charging stations by the end of this year. And so that'll help us um, establish uh, a network to support EV uh, adoption, which is um, leading the way here in BC. And in, ma in many cases for us, this means uh, serving the underserved void in the rural parts of our service territory. Uh, we've also built a network of natural gas for transportation fueling stations that we help heavy duty fleets uh, switch over to low, lower carbon fuels. The final pillar here is LNG for marine fueling. Uh, this pillar relates to using LNG instead of diesel and marine bunker oil for uh, heavy duty transport in the marine sector. Uh, so here we're, we're switching to LNG to reduce some um, carbon dioxide, but also particulates, NOx and SOx uh, emissions, which are a local air quality uh, concern. And then finally, LNG can also be used to displace coal and diesel in countries looking to clean up industry and energy generation. And together, these pillars uh, form the building blocks of how we're at Ford SBC looking to reduce emissions, and we're targeting to contribute approximately uh, just under four megatons to provincial abatement efforts by 2030, and we'll track our progress uh, as we go. Um, so just a note on sort of some of the, the look forward and key challenge. So in making our commitments uh, as an organization, an important part for us was looking forward and studying future scenarios uh, and their implications. And through our work looking into the future, we engaged a guide house uh, to help us better understand the challenges and opportunities in our jurisdiction as we consider different pathways and tools uh, to lower uh, emissions. So in the study, Guidehouse looked at two scenarios to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. Uh, the study was based on the par Paris targets due to the uh, its timing. But Guidehouse's first pathway relies on widespread electrification and the second relies on a diversified mix of emissions abatement alternatives. So to be clear, it was not a gas versus electric type of study. It was more a comparison of widespread electric electrification against an all of the above approach. And um, uh, the underlying question that we're really trying to answer here is what is the best way to get there? And so I'll share a couple of insights on the challenges we noted. So firstly, both pathways require a lot of electricity. However, the peak demand in the electrification pathway is almost double uh, the, of that of the diversified pathway. And so on the graph on the left on the slide here shows a comparison of peak demands both in 2030 and 2050 under both scenarios. And this is an important challenge. Uh, capacity is a fundamental consideration in energy delivery that reflects our uh, ability to deliver, uh, you know, deliver energy during peak conditions such as the cold winter when we are all heating our homes. And so this is a notable challenge. And while we'll hear a lot about the falling cost of energy, the cost of capacity actually remains uh, high. And in Guidehouse's study, capacity was provided by adding hydroelectric resources to meet the peak winter loads here in BC. Um, these projects are costly and complicated, but are necessary really in both scenarios. But the difference is that you need quite a few more in the electrification pathway, which highlights the fact that 
it is extremely difficult to take on the peak heating loads of the gas system because it turns out, as, as Malini mentioned earlier, the gas system is really good at delivering on peak energy needs. It has high deliverability, low cost storage, and the gas system delivers more than 1.6 times here in BC the energy of the electric, electric system on a, on a cold day. So I would be remiss though if I didn't point out that the, the diversified pathway, the all of the above pathway also has challenges. So I mentioned both pathways require significant electric capacity, um, but also the diversified pathway um, does rely much more heavily on renewable gases. And the chart on the right shows the scale up of renewable gases in the diversified pathway. So the challenge here is just to simply scale up to about 130 petajoules or more. But importantly, in doing the study, Guidehost did not just pick the number out of the air. They used a number of studies and sources that took a deep look at the potential for renewable gas production in BC. And so this will require us to leverage all available municipal and agricultural uh, wood waste and other feedstocks for renewable gas, as well as hydrogen from various sources, both green and blue. So maybe just um, flipping to the last uh, slide here to, to put a rather, um, you know, complicated topic on, on the back of an envelope. Um, I'll just close off with a, with a few key points here. So, you know, what did we really take away from this exercise? Most importantly is that climate action is not an either or debate when it comes to abatement options, rather it's both and, meaning that we need to pull on every available lever that we have. And this will contribute to a lower risk, lower cost path towards our climate targets, including net zero. And in Guidehouse, we found that um, there's a, you know, quite a cost difference, about $100 billion by the time you get to 2050 in savings from using the diver diversified uh, pathway. Um, secondly, we need to recognize the decarbonization potential of the gas system and its unique ability to provide peak energy for heating enabled by large amounts of low cost storage and high deliverability. And just as coal no longer is the source of electrons in many places in Canada, the gas system will undergo a similar transition as we head towards a low, low carbon energy. But the fundamental point is the gas network itself is an extremely valuable energy delivery and decarbonization tool. Um, we'll need to electrify target areas of our economy, such as transportation, but the peak loads of building sector, perhaps the not the best choice due to the cost of electric capacity. Um, and maybe just, just um, you know, cognizant of time here, um, I, I'll, I'll touch off on the last point is that finally, uh, this is not something that we can do alone. There's a lot, a huge need for collaboration between utilities, governments, key, enabler, key enablers, uh, indigenous communities, etc. And I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't say that uh, gas utilities are needed at the table and from my experience are creative and engaged problem solvers uh, in solving the climate challenge. So that's, uh, thank you for that and I'll pass it back to Jennifer. Okay, thanks so much, Doug. We are going to go into a polling question before we go to uh, some great questions from the audience. It's, it's uh, wonderful to see so much engagement here. So Tyson, you're going to bring up the question. And uh, you guys can see it there. What's the top solution for utility decarbonization to 2050? RNG H2. CCUS or new technologies. You can see some people voting here. We've got more than 200 people on the call right now, so let's see what we can get for participation. Let's move in fast. Those were great overviews from our presenters, and um, we've got a lot of good questions to start once we finish our polling here. Okay, we're up over 100, so maybe in the interest of time, I'm not sure if you can stop the poll now, Tyson. Okay, uh, here we are, we're still going. 
So it looks like uh, the consensus is, uh, I guess there really isn't a consensus, we see a bit of everything here, but um, new technology seems to be where it's at. So we don't know yet what is going to be our solution for the next 30 years. And uh, I guess that makes sense with everything related to technology these days. So uh, with that, we will bring our panelists on. And um, I will ask them what they think of the poll to start. See who's, whose camera comes on first. Okay. Wow. I think we've got Frederick first. What do you think of that poll? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, honestly, uh, I would have answered, uh, shown uh, the uh, option that was not there. I would have chosen E, all of the above. And I think that reflects a bit what I had in mind because I think at some point they're all connected. Uh, we absolutely need to integrate an increasing amount of, I'd say, renewable gases not just renewable gas, but a variety of gases to our supply. And they will come from various sources and technologies, uh, different feedstocks, organic matter, wood biomass, hydrogen, a combination of hydrogen, CO2 through carbon capture. So I think they're all part of the solution and they're all connected. And uh, at the end, the, the, the main objective is to uh, reduce the footprint of what's in the pipe. So um, I, I agree with uh, the results. That's great. Okay, so let's move to our questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to pick on uh, Jackie Ashley, who I know well from uh, BC. She works in, uh, she's involved in a lot of CanPUT committees uh, with me. And her question is directed towards uh, Doug, actually. So it's Fortis BC. What did Guidehouse assume as the avoidable cost of electricity? Is that is just a quick one. Did they consider recent significant decreases in the cost of wind, solar batteries? Um, thank you for the question. So uh, there's two two things here. So we're talking both energy and capacity. So um, Guidehouse assumed that um, as far as energy costs, uh, you know, low cost wind and solar would be um, a key part of delivering energy. But as far as uh, capacity is concerned, um, Guidehouse assumed that capacity would come from new hydroelectric resources here in BC. And so, um, you know, they, they based uh, the uh, cost of those resources on, you know, recent projects and uh, best available uh, information. Excellent. Okay, and now I'm going to go to Melanie because we haven't had her uh, answer question yet. Uh, another question from Jackie, would there be a benefit from increased cross-Canada collaboration in resource planning so we can share information uh, on key inputs and best practices? I think that's a great oh, question. Uh, absolutely, great question. By the way, I'm having some problems with my webcam, so I'm not able to uh, get back on. Um, but my mic works, so that's great. Yeah, you uh, sound great. <laughs> so um, I, I would completely agree with that statement in terms of uh, cross collaboration between jurisdictions, and uh, and I'd provide two perspectives on it. Uh, the first is, you know, just as we talked about the need to integrate our energy systems. Uh, you know, within our provinces, there's obviously the opportunity to integrate our energy systems across provinces. In fact, our natural gas systems have been a really good example of that. We have a North America-wide competitive uh, interconnected market already. So certainly there's a huge opportunity to continue to do that and create more connectivity in the electric uh, transmission space as well. But the other area for collaboration is really one of um, you know, each utility or each jurisdiction leveraging the competitive advantages it has and being able to provide that. And uh, so I'll pick hydrogen as an example of that. You know, so for example, um, Enbridge uh, is very proud to have been sort of the pioneer of uh, utility scale power to gas projects in Ontario. So we put one in in 2018. Uh, and certainly that served as a basis I can't tell you how many people have come and visited our project in Markham, Ontario. And that served as a basis for the next scale up. So we've put in a two megawatt plant. The next project to come along is a 20 megawatt plant using that same technology, the PEM technology. So here's an example where you know, putting a pilot in place and showing its successful uh, operation can trigger 
sort of the, the next stage, and that obviously builds over time. But this scope and scale goes beyond that even. So when I think about how we've collaborated with Fortis PC and Energir and ATCO and uh, you know, the other gas utilities, in fact, even across North America, we're looking at some of these technologies, for example, heat pump technology to ask ourselves, what is the benefit of having a combined, or let's say at least in Canada, you know, we're looking at about 6 million natural gas users and bringing them together to see if these technologies are deployable and expand that to North America. And all of a sudden you might be looking at 30 or 40 million gas users that can have the benefit of this technology. So, uh, you know, just to say, I completely agree with the premise. There's a lot of industry associations, including the CGA, uh, the National Gas Innovation Fund, and then the AGA that are working on this sort of collaboration within the gas space. Oh yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, another question we have here is, how do we ensure that we're putting the goal of, excuse me, of net zero above our corporate bottom lines? In areas where they uh, conflict, can we even do this? Or do we need the pressure of carbon tax, public perception, and regulation to drive us to be part of the solution? That's a, that's a tough one. It's always that balance between them. I'm not sure who wants to take that on. Doug, you're on camera. I, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, thank you for the question, Jennifer. So. I would start by saying that you know utilities are very motivated to participate in um, you know in climate change, and as you could see from the speakers here today, a variety of plans to you know to help us get there over time. And so, to me, there's ample evidence of um, you know utilities looking to deploy new technologies, incorporating lower carbon offerings, and a great deal of looking towards the future to figure out how, you know, how they and their assets can provide value in that low carbon future. I would say though that, you know, fundamentally when you look at energy delivery utilities, uh, we all must adhere to sort of, um, you know, four basic tenets of, of energy delivery today. We must provide safe, reliable, affordable, and decarbonize ener energy. So, you know, it's not a one issue debate, but rather a complex multifaceted issue for us to deal with. And so, you know, it's really important that we don't oversimplify the problem and, and um, get into a, a single issue um, debate here. Um, you know, this is, this is sort of what's happened in certain jurisdictions around, uh, you know, around our continent with rolling brownouts where we've, you know, say forgotten about what reliability uh, you know, means to people in terms of the security and adequacy of supply. Those are really important issues that can't be overlooked as we take uh, meaningful climate action. And we know that, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, failing to, you know, consider reliability or failing to consider decarbonization are both equally as challenging, uh, you know, to, to the business. And so the point here is that it's not uh, it's not easy. It's not an easy problem to solve, and I think utilities are very well engaged in this. Um, and that uh, the challenge is really how can we take um, you know take the, the the value that we provide through the safe, affordable, and reliable energy provision, and uh, you know add decarbonization to that and take meaningful climate action. And then I would say just to answer the last part of that question. You know, I do think that there will be a mix of obligations and incentives in every economy to encourage transformation. Um, you know, these are necessary policy tools in some cases to make, you know, make it easier for utilities to um, to help and, and others to help. Uh, for example, in BC, we have, um, you know, uh, just pick one example, the greenhouse gas reduction regulation, which has, uh, you know, found that the procurement of um, renewable gas in certain circumstances to be a prescribed undertaking, making it easier for utilities and, and a streamlined way to advance the procurement of, of renewable gas. So, you know, there's there's great ways. It's, I think it is a mix of incentives and obligations or, uh, you know, to, to help us get there. But I, I think they're all necessary. And and I think, um, as I mentioned at the, the last part of my a piece that gas utilities and, and other utilities are creative, engaged problem solvers and uh, up for the challenge. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and it's sort of as a follow on from that, and I'll throw this over to you, uh, Frederick. Uh, what is the communication strategy there? How do we effectively communicate the approach to all the different stakeholders? So, of course, we have employees, the general public, communities we serve, 
um, of course, governments, regulators, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we communicate what we'll be doing, how much will it cost, uh, who, what, when, where, et cetera? Well, how do we? I think we have to define the we because I think it's the role of utilities, but it's not just our role. Uh, I think it's broader than that. And I think that to do so, uh, we need some kind of alignment between um, the public policies, uh, the regulatory framework, and the energy solutions that utilities put forward. Um, it's not just about, and my colleagues have said that before, about competing interests, but how we can have a broader view of uh, the public interests and the different options and alternatives that we can put forward to decarbonize at a lower cost. And I think we're not used to do that. Uh, we're used to looking at the different options in silos instead of looking at the different options uh, altogether. So before communicating on uh, decarbonization and the cost and benefits, I think we need to broaden our scope of analysis and to have a better alignment between all these uh, perspectives, policies, regulation, and the energy solutions that we put forward. The other thing is, um, I think that, uh, and Doug touched upon it, we often communicate on affordability and reliability, and that's a value for the customer, but uh, the decarbonization, decarbonization part or sustainability part, I think need to be uh, put forward. Um, it's not just about the financial or the economics or the, I'd say, impacts on rate on today's customer, but about what we're building for the future. So we need to have this broader perspective and to look at it in a longer time frame as well. So I think uh, I'm not directly answering the question, but to have these messages and to be able to communicate clearly, I think we need to be aligned on that before uh, getting out there. Uh, I think we're getting there, but I think there's still work to be done uh, to, to, to get there. Okay, that's great. So we have a question here from Adrian at Natural Resources Canada, and I'll throw this one over to Melanie. How easy or difficult is a process to get approval from utility regulators to implement innovative projects related to net zero? I guess you could ask me that as a regulator, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, I have to say, um, part of the difficulty I think for regulators is the way their statutory um, objectives or obligations are defined. And, you know, to the extent that the statutory obligations deal purely with safe, affordable, reliable energy, I think regulators sometimes um, have to wrestle with the idea of where does decarbonization fit into this. So it's certainly easier, of course, if decarbonization is included as a goal in, in regulatory objectives. But I don't know that it necessarily, I mean, I, I, I don't think the Ontario Energy Board, for example, has this explicitly, but it hasn't prevented the Ontario Energy Board from being very receptive to many innovative ideas that we brought forward. So, for example, you know, just recently we got uh, our, the first North American application to blend hydrogen with natural gas approved by the Ontario Energy Board. So we got that approval in October of last year. We put a lot of thought into what would the OAB need to see in order to approve this application. And a lot of thought went into it, right to the point of, you know, we are refunding $8 per year to the 3,600 customers that would benefit from this blended gas to account for that very small impact on heating value from blending hydrogen with natural gas. So I think I, I pride myself on thinking that our team put a lot of granular attention to all of the things that the regulator would be concerned about and made sure it was addressed in the proposal. Similarly, right now, you know, we are looking at integrated resource planning or the notion that the utility should continue to attach customers but look to rationalize how it expands its pipeline infrastructure to see if there are other things it can do, demand response, you know, innovative technology, et cetera. Um, there's technology funding, which I know and um, for the species case, you know, their regulator approved the ability to invest in technology. So I think there's a lot that regulators can do even within the ex existing construct, but certainly uh, explicitly adding decarbonization to those goals uh, allows us to go forward. 
Yeah, does anyone else have anything to add on that? Or I can move on to the next question. We're good, okay. So the next question is for you, Doug. And uh, this is from Albert of the Burns Lake Band. And uh, he is asking if uh, Fortis BC is familiar with the ESG standards and have do you have a plan to meet those standards? And he says, and thanks for acknowledging Indigenous uh, peoples in your presentation. Of course. Yes, thank you very much for the question, Albert. Um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, ESG is, uh, you know, just increasingly uh, important um, and, uh, you know, a big focus at, at Fortis BC. And, um, you know, I know we, uh, you know, the sustainability and, um, you know, environment, social governance uh, piece uh, uh, filters into everything we do. Um, you know, really, I think some of the, the challenge, you know, in gas utilities is we've got, um, you know, we've got a great story to tell and, and uh, ESG is an, an excellent way to do that. And so, um, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, to, to answer the question, um, yeah, absolutely, uh, you know, ESG, if, if you're not, um, you know, thinking about that, especially in the uh, energy delivery space, you're really missing out on opportunities. Um, you know, whether, you know, for us, for example, we, we issued a, our first green bond this past year uh, to fund some of our, um, you know, uh, energy efficiency, renewable gas type projects. Um, you know, there's a big opportunity in, in, in all of that. And yeah, if you're not pursuing it, you're really missing out. Great. Uh, okay, this is a question. I'm not sure who might be able to answer this one. It's from Audrey at Questar Technology, Inc. MIT has done a study on net zero and identified energy efficiency and methane elimination as the low hanging fruit. Uh, methane is 86 times worse than CO2. Did not see any discussion on reducing methane emissions as part of the net zero path. Can somebody comment on that? Uh, I, I can start, I'm sure okay, all thanks, my Mom. panelists would, uh, would like to add to that. So uh, yes, we absolutely recognize uh, that, in fact, I would say in the gas utility business, and certainly I think Canadian utilities have been at the forefront of reducing leaks in their system by eliminating cast iron pipes, for example. I know, I know in Ontario, um, we got rid of them by the 1990s, but not, that's not necessarily the case in a lot of US utilities. Um, you know, and so the, the task of reducing methane in the distribution system um, is, is usually pipe related, uh, you know, compressor related, um, but certainly upstream, you know, there's a, a lot more emphasis on, on methane reduction. So I do think, I agree that methane reductions are a quick win in the sense that while they are uh, obviously, you know, have greater impact than CO2, uh, they also last for much less time. So there's an opportunity there to address um, methane emissions across the entire um, value system. Maybe if I can pass that on to my other speakers. I know Energir has is looking at uh, carbon intensity of natural gas. Yeah, yeah maybe if may Melanie, I, we we did that, and maybe to add to your point, you know, a few years ago, uh, before the big shale boom, uh, we were not really, um, I'd say, uh, asked by customers and by stakeholders about what's in the pipe. You know, where's your, gas come, where's your gas coming from? How is it produced? What are the environmental impacts? But over the last few years, it has become top priority. So we have as a utility to address that, although it's upstream of our operating business, it's uh, something that we need to, uh, to address uh, and to be able to be some kind of accountable for that to our, to our customers. So that's why we did on our end a uh, life cycle analysis to be able to evaluate where are the emissions from the gas we deliver coming from production, transportation, distribution, or consumption, and then to be addressed to be able to address these uh, these emissions. So, for instance, we've put forward a natural gas uh, responsible procurement approach where producers can be certified on their practices, and uh, so we're able to. Uh, to um, disclose this information to our stakeholders and to our, our customers. So although it's not directly in our operating scope, I think we need to be able to be uh, accountable uh, for that to our, uh, to our stakeholders. Okay. 
And uh, it's interesting, there's a general societal trend to have less trust in experts and institutions. How do regulators increase public trust in them? Start with you, Doug. Um, <clears throat> so how, how do regulators increase public trust? I think it's it's kind of the same way that, that utilities um, do. We have to be a trusted source for, for information. And um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's difficult. There's lots of dialogue out there today and it's not all, you know, it, it's a lot of it is driven by emotion and a lot of it's very polarizing. But I think, uh, you know, regulators and utilities need to sort of stick to the, um, you know, stick to the facts, stick to the science and, uh, you know, and, and make, um, you, you know, uh, be solutions oriented with a vision that aligns with uh, objectives of government. Um, you know, how can we create win-wins? And I think that's what's going to help us, uh, uh, you know, prevail. U ultimately, you know, ultimately there's a lot of voices out there, but those that deliver results will be, will be heard in the end and trusted. And, um, you know, some of the uh, potential um, noise in this, in this very public debate about climate action uh, will, will filter out over time. So, yeah, I, I think it's just coming down to uh, being led by, you know, real fact and information and uh, delivering on, on results. Yeah, um, if, if I could just add uh, back to that, I think, you know, one of the things that utilities do well, actually, is consult with their stakeholders. And one of the things that I think regulators can help um, drive more of that trust with the public uh, is to um, help their utilities engage more. Um, so one of the things that we are trying to do, for example, is not only have these stakeholder conversations, but also commit to you know, transparency around what those conversations were, commit to responding to concerns, and make sure that when these issues are actually brought back to our regulator for approval, that we can demonstrate that those conversations occurred and that engagement um, you know, drove certain outcomes. And, and so just drawing that link on our consultations and being able to be transparent about them and have them considered and debated in our adjudicated processes, hopefully uh, will help in it, but it, it's a complex question. Agree with that. Absolutely. Okay, and I think we have, it's, uh, we have four minutes left, our last question of the session. This is, comes from Matthew at Sask Energy. Is there a way to explicitly encourage friendly competition between CGA member companies to improve their energy transition plans and goals? Uh, he says, when I hear about some of the other companies are doing across Canada, so um, Fortis and Bridge, et cetera, it appears to me that some of my own company's targets are lagging. I would love for our aspirations to be deepened by the targets of other companies. Any comments on that? What does your regulator allow you to do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It depends on a lot of factors, you know, regulation, you know, the energy profile of your, of your jurisdiction as well, uh, public policies. Um, so it's, it's tough to, 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 to compare, I think. But I think, uh, as we've shown, we're all uh, focusing on the same, I think, uh, same, same solution to decarbonize. And I think on that, we can have a common agenda to uh, and push that forward, uh, although there may be differences in uh, our own jurisdictions. I also just to add to that, I think success is infectious. And, and I think that there's a great deal of, um, you know, maybe to that first question, a collaboration across the industry already. So, um, you know, I guess we'll, we'll have to uh, keep challenging each other in order to, you know, uh, accelerate the pace of, of um, success here. Excellent. Well, that is a great place, I think, for us to end off this session. Thanks so much to uh, Melanie, Frederick, and Doug for your insights and uh, inspiration. And thanks, everyone, for listening. I'll turn it back over to Monica. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. What a terrific session. Uh, it was a really terrific discussion and I think, you know, a great illustration that the virtual technology can be engaging. I found it very engaging, uh, really uh, great discussion. And these are precisely the sorts of issues we need to be 
digging into. Clearly, there's lots of desire on the part of gas utilities to contribute to reaching Canada's 2050 ambitions, uh, and obviously lots of potential as well to, to do so. But uh, that discussion brought forward as well, there are limitations and obstacles to address in order to unlock uh, that potential. So that's this session was really helpful, I think, in improving our understanding of some of those uh, challenges. So we're going to move straight into our next panel, uh, which focuses on another key issue on the road to 2050, affordability. How do we keep costs in balance in the years ahead? What are industrial and residential consumer expectations? What about citizens, youth, and civil society? What are they looking for? So we have a really top-notch panel to discuss these crucial questions. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for this session, Diane Allen. Diane is the president of Measurement Canada, which is responsible for ensuring accuracy in measured goods. Diane's career in the public service includes senior positions in a variety of portfolios, where she has played a pivotal strategic role to ensure the public, service is, the public service is successful in delivering its operational agenda and its modernization agenda. This sounds like she's the perfect person for uh, this panel. So Diane, over to you. Thanks, Monica. I'm not sure if my webcam is gonna go up here. I was having some challenges, to, but I just wanna make sure everybody can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, and it looks like we're about to start seeing you. Terrific. I will leave you it. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So um, I have the great pleasure of introducing four panelists today. Um, so rather than go in order as was done with the previous session, I'll just introduce everybody um, now. So our first speaker will be Meredith Adler, who is the Executive Director for Student Energy. It's a global youth-led uh, organization. Uh, that's creating the next generation of energy leaders who will accelerate our transition to a sustainable energy future. With over 50,000 students uh, committed to a sustainable energy from over 120 countries around the world, Meredith works uh, to develop young people's capacity to be change agents while working with the energy uh, industry, governments, and organizations to create space for intergenerational collaboration. Our second speaker will be Dan McTeague, who's the president and of Canadians for Affordable Energy. He's an 18-year veteran of the House of Commons, and Dan is widely known for his tireless work on energy pricing and saving Canadians money through accurate price forecasts. His parliamentary initiatives aimed at helping Canadians cope with affordable energy costs uh, and led to providing Canadians with heat, uh, heating fuel rebates for at least two occasions. Widely sought for his extensive experience uh, and work and knowledge in energy pricing, Dan continues to provide valuable insights to North American media and policymaker he brings over three decades of experience and proven efforts on behalf of computer consumers in both private and public spheres. Our third speaker will be uh, Sharzad Rabar, who is the president and CEO of Industrial Gas Users Association. She brings uh, with us 20 years of progressively senior experience in the grass, gas industry and over a decade of which uh, she has been vice president with the gas, uh, Canadian Gas Association. She's been a very active uh, contributor to the development of energy, technology, and regulatory policy in Canada. She has a PhD in mechanical engineering from the UK and two patents to her name. And she has served on the executive committee of the Interna International Gas and as vice chair of the Quality Urban Energy System of Tomorrow. And our last speaker will be Jay Shepard, who's the principal of Shepard Rubenstein. Jay Shepard is the founder and the senior lawyer at Shepard Rubenstein, a Toronto law firm that specializes in regulatory law. He spent much of his 40-plus uh, years uh, in legal career, appearing before the Ontario Energy Board. And he represents clients of diver as diverse as the School of Energy Coalition, the HVAC Coalition, the Association of Power Producers of Ontario, and the Ontario Geothermal Association. He has also uh, written extensively a number, uh, of, in, a number of areas, including taxation, energy policy, and regulation in fiduciaries, and the later, including his book in the Law of Fiduciary Fiduciaries, which was published in 1981. For 11 years, he's also taught uh, tax uh, at uh, Osgoode Law, uh, Osgood Hall uh, Law School. So with that, before we turn over to the uh, panel members, I know we're going to do a bit of a polling uh, session. So I'm going to ask Tyson, there's a couple of polls out there, two questions that are going to be asked of members and audience today. So if we can get going on that one, that would be great.
So the first question, as you can see, is do you see a challenge for gas distribution visit in a net, a net zero carbon future? Um, and we are seeing a lot of yes uh, coming up as it keeps keep going up in the votes. Okay, I think that uh, I think the yes is the majority there. I would say Tyson. I think it's probably okay to close the poll for that one. Um, and then we also have a second poll question, uh, which is going to be coming up in a moment. The second question is: Do you see a challenge for consumers in a net zero carbon future? Lots of yes on this one as well, I can see. Yeah, okay. All right, so we definitely have two yeses in that. Uh, so thanks, uh, Tyson. I think we're okay to close the poll for that one. Now I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. So over to you, Meredith. Thank you. Mm. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Adler. I'm the Executive Director of Student Energy Global. So we're an organization that was founded in Calgary, Alberta about 12 years ago, um, and we're the leading organization globally on youth engagement in energy and capacity building and training for young people um, who are interested in the energy transition. Um, so I just have a few quick comments around what we're seeing as trends for future consumers, and then also why it's very applicable to the businesses represented here today. And I think to skip to the punchline, um, working with young people is often how you can really predict where your consumers and where the voter base is going for the next 10 years. Um, often people are really formulating their opinions on their values as a consumer and as a voter um, before they turn 25. And so when you're engaging at a young age, you're really able to get a great pulse check on, on what consumers and voters are thinking going forward. Um, and what we're seeing really firmly from the youth community right now is a few different things. One is that young people are increasingly concerned about climate change and they're looking for strong ways to take action on climate change in their daily life and specifically as a consumer. And so you're seeing a lot of different consumer advocacy pieces happening um, and, and how that applies to energy is often young people are kind of getting a bad rap <laughs> for only protesting, only being angry about the situation. But really what young people are looking for is really tangible ways to contribute to shaping an energy future that will provide for a climate safe future for them. So if you're thinking about somebody who's 20 years old, in 2050, they'll be 50, they're not, um, you know, they're still going to have a long career ahead of them. And so they're really thinking about what are the long-term costs of climate change over the short-term costs of, of any specific energy product today, um, especially in Canada, when you consider the incredibly high cost of housing, um, food, education, all the things that young people are dealing with, what they really are looking for is a larger system change around how we address issues so that we don't end up with all these multiple competing crises that they're facing today during the pandemic. Um, and I think the, the final thing I'll say on it is that, um, is that when, when young people are considering costs specifically, um, and looking at different companies and the types of policies that they want to support, what they are really looking for more and more is transparency, is transparency in how different types of decisions um, are being made and transparency in, um, in what their regulators are looking at um, and things of that nature. And so a lot of the regulatory processes and, and other pieces we have happening in Canada today are not seen as transparent and are not seen as taking into account um, the really long-term view that young people are hoping for. Um, so I'll leave that there for now. Okay, our next speaker is Dan. So go ahead, Dan. And uh, 
very much I want to thank everybody for the organization here and putting uh, this wonderful event together and I think we have a pretty dynamic uh, crowd here uh, as well as uh, some of the presenters who I've heard a little bit from before and I think it'll give you quite an opportunity uh, to assess uh, the different various uh, approaches that we're taking to the issue of affordability. Before we go on too long, I think the issue of net zero 2050 uh, is a little bit of getting ahead of ourselves and I think uh, we need to provide context. Uh, for many of us, uh, goals like reaching our current uh, carbon emissions seem to be elusive. We have uh, information this morning from the Department of Environment suggesting that uh, not only are we going to miss uh, this year and last year's goals, uh, uh, we've made really no impact in terms of dropping emissions. Uh, we're unlikely to see uh, our ability to reach the 2030 goals, much less be able to talk or discuss about what we're going to do in 2050. There's nothing wrong with planning. But part of that planning has to take into consideration the consumers. As a parliamentarian, I always uh, refer to it as the CRTC rule, uh, because of course, uh, while ideas uh, among uh, those who are in the know and opinion leaders, that includes politicians, media, academics, are a wonderful thing, at the end of the day, they really do not resonate, nor are they constructive or helpful, or in fact, impactful uh, and bringing people together when in fact they hurt uh, individuals. And we see this uh, sort of idea that has been propagated in the past of making decisions uh, without taking consumer consumers into consideration. So this so-called CRTC rule. I'm most concerned uh, as well about the current status. You don't have to go very far backwards or forwards in terms of understanding where we stand. When uh, MNP, uh, Debt and Solvency Corporation, reveals that the growing number of Canadians facing insolvency are less than $200 away from achieving that terrible goal at a time in which we're dealing with a true crisis, a real pandemic. I think it requires all of us to stand up and to understand and to appreciate that while we talk a great deal about what regulators ought to do, what governments want those regulators to do, we often forget that it is those at the end of the line uh, who are paying for this. That, is, that are often forgotten. And for that reason alone, I think it's critical that if we're going to undertake any type of activity towards net zero, uh, which would mean inevitably, not just a compromise of affordability, but also an undermining, a, a significant undermining of energy security, that we begin to tabulate those costs. Now, I spent a career telling people what the cost is gonna be, not just for gasoline, but for other products two or three days down the road. And I can assure you that as a parliamentarian in my previous job, uh, in 2008 when my party, the Liberal Party, attempted the green shift, it was all wonderful uh, and it made a lot of sense to some, others it didn't. But it came down to one simple issue, dollars and cents. Could people find their ability to make ends meet at a time of increasing energy prices? And the answer was no. We're a country that's bequeathed with a significant amount of energy diversity. Uh, so choosing one energy over another, electricity versus natural gas, is always uh, something I think many other countries would look at and say it's rather odd of a country that is blessed with as, ma as many resources as it is. I think we have to also take into consideration uh, that when we are going down this road of uh, suggesting perhaps natural gas and hydrogen and other things as the new uh, economy towards that so-called goal, which is very undefined by the way, not just for business but for consumers of 2050, that we have a better understanding of what we're advocating. And I think in the context of what I'm seeing here, for instance, in Ontario, we have con people concerned about colder temperatures, concerned that they're not gonna be able to make ends meet, bills are starting to come in, and yet they see uh, examples of municipalities in my province of Ontario, 30, 40 of them already saying, get rid of natural gas plants, the kind of plants that back up those reliable uh, sources of energy, uh, the so-called renewables, the path forward to 2050, as it were. We need natural gas to back up those unreliables, as we saw in the case of Texas most recently, and as we saw in the case of California. And we have this massive disconnect between the opinion leaders and the public who has to pay for this. Uh, so I would suggest it's really important, I think our parliamentarians, our representatives, uh, those uh, in government and in governance and regulators and media begin to understand the significant implications of the things that they are demanding. We all want to do what's right by the uh, by climate and by the environment, but we also have to take into account the uh, the fact that we are going to lose people significantly and uh, politicians alike. I know I've been through that period before of losing uh, my job as a parliamentarian. 
when you become disconnected with reality, and I think that's where we are heading in terms of some of these notions on, on uh, net zero 2050, you don't have to take my word for it. Other governments, India being a good example, saying this is pie in the sky. This is not, uh, this is untenable. Uh, these are things that I think we have to have a much wider debate on rather than getting carried away with all you wonderful trendy ideas that might serve a certain constituency. And we may have told people that this is the way we have to go. But when it comes down to asking them how they're going to make ends meet and understanding that Canada can already celebrate some of the cleanest energy uh, provisions in the world. My riding, my former riding Pickering, one of the first commercial nuclear reactors in North America, been around for 50 years. Uh, I live in Oakville right now. The power, the power that's coming to my home that allows me to speak to you comes from the Adam Beck uh, plant in, Nat in Niagara Falls. So the idea of clean energy isn't new. Uh, but what is new is our unwillingness to consider and to take into account the significant energy diversity which this country has been blessed with and for which, if we forget, we are likely to lead to policies in which there are going to be two options. Those who advocate, demand, and in fact create a sort of absolutist approach of imposing new technologies that are going to be extraordinarily expensive if in fact they exist in the next 34 years from a, phys from a physics point of view, or people who simply are going to revolt. And I think that's the kind of discussion that I think we need to have, bearing in mind that it's good to talk about what we want, but I think we also have to be practical about what we can achieve. It's on that basis that I look forward to your questions and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Jan. Uh, next speaker will be Sharzad. for organizing uh, this wonderful exchange. I'm happy to share a few thoughts with you. Um, I, I, I've been around conversations around climate and carbon mitigation for, uh, suffice to say, when my hair was not gray at all. Um, so, a um, few comments. Um, first of all, I think the transition to lower carbon has begun. Um, uh, and it's no longer in the realm of policy. We're seeing it move from policy file to an operational imperative, um, evidenced by what we heard from the previous panel in the utilities and hopefully what I can share with you and some of the consumers. So I think the transition has begun. It will fundamentally impact the way society produces, distributes and consumes energy and manages its emissions. This, however, should not mean the death knell for Canada's industry, industrial economy. The world will still continue to need bulk materials, um, metals, chemicals, minerals, bio-based and zero uh, carbon materials, as well as conventional materials. Canada has the wealth of natural and human resources, clean power, research capability, um, and industrial know-how to become a um, world uh, supplier of carbon neutral or low carbon commodities. And we finally have a federal plan um, that recognizes uh, that heavy industry is an opportunity, not, uh, not a problem and uh, necessary for the future success of Canada. Within large industrial circles, decarbonization has shifted from being a regulatory compliance issue um, to, be, to be mindful of and try and manage to a corporate imperative mandated by the board, the CEO, and driven by shareholders and investors. So it has gone from something to manage to an opportunity. Many of uh, my members, the large industrial companies have uh, corporate commitments to decarbonize by 2050. Um, decarbonization, it's exciting for me because decarbonization is mustering substantial management, engineering and operational resources within the companies far beyond the relatively modest regulatory and advocacy resources that even a few years ago, where what was paying attention to this file. 
I also don't think from an industrial perspective, this decarbonization should be the death knell of the gas infrastructure. Uh, natural gas serves a variety of purposes in industry from feedstock to part of the chemistry, in addition to process heat and backup fuel, many of which can simply not be electrified. So uh, decarbonization of heavy industry is more complex than simply getting off gas. In many instances, using more gas might be uh, a very viable first step to major carbon, uh, carbon reduction. So I agree with everything that the earlier panel had said. Um, just wanted to kind of give you a bit of a different flavor from a consumer perspective and from a large consumer uh, perspective. Uh, when we look at, uh, when EM and the large industrial consumers look at decarbonization, they view it through a slightly different calculus at the LDCs. Everything for large industrial, at least the ones I represent, which are bought mainly in the commodity business competing inter internationally, not in the high margin consumer facing business, but in the commodity business. Our, our calculus is international uh, uh, competitiveness. And substitution of natural gas input uh, even in applications that can be electrified for industrial operations is a high cost, a lumpy investment and failing uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and constrained by multi-decade capital investment cycles. So this is uh, kind of where for some of our applications, we're always going to need access. You can't need products from electrons when the product needs the molecule. So we will we worry that we'll be the last people standing on the line and we'd like to see uh, both uh, our energy grids exist. We like the optionality, we like the resilience that having multiple energy grids um, brings. It does, however, mean uh, a major change in how industry uses gas and what they do uh, with the emissions from that gas. Um, for a minute, going back uh, to the utility, it was a pleasure listening to Melanie Giridar in the earlier panel. Uh, you know, uh, in Ontario, the utility made the transition from the street lighting business uh, when that was no longer possible. Electricity had sort of eroded that business. They shifted to the home heating business. Maybe it's time, I expect we'll see another pivot uh, to ensure that valuable gas pipeline assets continue to provide uh, economic development and well-being for Ontarians. Um, on um, just a couple of observations, I mean, much has been said about RNG and uh, hydrogen. Um, and both of those are very serious viable options for industry as it looks at its decarbonization. We, um, we do look forward to working more closely with our colleagues in, in the gas distribution business. Um, these opportunities um, can be presented in a way that are more palatable to, to consumers. A blended uh, mix of RNG without clear identification of carbon intensity potentially for industry is just a cost burden that we would hope to avoid. Making that same RNG available with its CI presents a phenomenal opportunity for which industrials might be willing to pay a premium above the average blended regulatory rates that are appearing in the, in the different provinces. Hydrogen, similarly, many of, uh, uh, many of our heavy industries are looking at hydrogen as a potential way to decarbonize and manage their carbon footprint. However, um, again, having a hyphen blend in the pipeline just is added cost. Having access to hydrogen is a different story. So a uh, message from our heavy industry is we see gas infrastructure as in our decarbonization. We would like to work with the utilities to find solutions that work. 
Um, given the scope and magnitude of the emissions that are involved and the fact that most of the large industries are directly regulated either by the province or the feds for managing their, their emissions, most of them would be not looking at the gas utility to manage their decarbonization. This is very much a corporate decision that they want to stay in control of. That might be a different approach from other consumers, perhaps on system gas, for whom the utility needs to manage the footprint. I think, uh, I hope as we go further along in this transition, there would be opportunities um, to, to collaborate strategically and frame uh, pathways and transition pathways that would keep industry competitive, would allow the gas infrastructure to contribute to the solution, and look forward uh, to exploring some of those in the questions. I look forward to the questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Sharzad. Over to you now, Jay. Hi. Uh, so, um, I, uh, I heard a lot in the previous panels about how complicated this all is decarbonizing the gas industry, and I, I want to simplify it. The gas industry is in the business of producing and distributing a fossil fuel, usually for the purpose of com combustion, not always, but usually. That's a legacy business. In a low carbon future, there's not much room for that business. So, but it's worse than that, because the part of the gas industry that in which I'm involved, uh, transmission and distribution, relies on a regulated business model. That, that part of the business can literally only increase profits by increasing capital investment in capital assets that are solely there to deliver fossil fuels. So you can see the dilemma. You have to spend money, our money, on capital that is inimical to the Car the low carbon future. So from the point of view of my clients, and for that matter, for, from the point of view of my kids, this is about stranded assets. Now, I, I wanna be really clear, this is not about making the world a better place, and it's not about fighting climate change. We can debate those things if you like, and I'll channel my, my inner Greta Thunberg, but that's not what this is about. <clears throat> this is not about what should happen. This is about what will happen we will have a lower carbon future. That's a reality the gas industry needs to face. So what are your options? Well, your first two options are if you wanna keep the regulated business model. And if you do, you only have really two choices. I'll get to the one you talked about the most, but, but the two realistic choices you have are you can find a solution to cheap carbon capture and storage at the point of combustion, Good luck with that. Um, or you can buy other regulated businesses that don't produce carbon, which means essentially buy electricity transmitters or distributors, one of the things that Energy has done. Um, then the third option and the only other option is you can move away from being regulated because all the other solutions, the other low carbon solutions, they're not naturally regulated. So if you move away from being regulated, here's the problem. Your current shareholders invested in a regulated business. They're not going to stay invested in your company, in your companies, if uh, you're in a competitive business. There's lots of competitive businesses they can invest in. They want to be in a regulated business, and if you're not in it, they're not there. So there are then two other options. And these are the ones that are most often on the table in these discussions. The first is no carbon gas, decarbonized gas. So that, that has two flavors, hydrogen or uh, RNG. The former hydrogen is not viable because it's viable in small amounts, but fundamentally your pipes and most of the end use appliances can't handle hydrogen. It's a matter of physics. And we know this. And this is why, while hydrogen is absolutely in our future, and hydrogen is a very good thing, I love hydrogen, but um, hydrogen is not going to be the replacement for natural gas in your pipes. 
Then the second is RNG, and that's not viable, and we know it's not viable, because there's not enough feedstock and there never will be. And yes, there are, there are technologies that may come forth in the future that will help you with that, will increase the amount of that, but in the end, RNG is not gonna replace all of the natural gas we're using today. There's no possibility that that's the case. So then the, the second option, which nobody wants to talk about directly, is delay. That is, keep talking about the energy transition, make sure it sounds really complicated, and keep putting pipes in the ground. And here's what my final point is. Throughout this whole discussion, I have heard nothing from anybody about putting fewer pipes in the ground, about spending less on capital to create future stranded assets. So right now, you, the gas chute industry, assume that you'll be able to recover the entire cost of assets that you're building today. If you put pipe in the ground today, the regulatory compact is, you're entitled to collect that over the life of the asset. There's a catch. That only works if you still have regulated customers for the full lives of those assets. But enter the death spiral. If in fact, we are going to a low carbon future. If in fact, what's really happening is my kids may be buying houses with, that are heated by natural gas because they're in their 30s. Their kids will not. They will not buy a house that burns fossil fuels to heat it, period. They just won't. So if that's the case, then there won't be customers except IGUA members to pay for those assets 20, 30, 40 years from now. And guess who pays? Your shareholders. Despite the regulatory compact, they pay. So from my point of view, your strategy, the, the approach you should take should start with put less pipe in the ground. Create less stranded assets, we'll all be better off. My job here was to be the troublemaker at the end. I hope I've succeeded. Thanks, Jay. Um, all right, so I just wanted to give now the panelists an opportunity to um, have a bit of a discussion on the, the discussions that took place from each of the panelists. So I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith, Dan, Jay, and Sharzad to see if they wanted to add uh, additional perspectives as a result of the panelists' conversation so far. So over to you. Perhaps I could ask uh, my good uh, capable colleague, Jay, uh, if that means not putting any future pipes into the ground, uh, how do we accommodate uh, simple things uh, that often eludes our policymakers, as in the growth of population? Sooner or later, we're going to need some kind of way to heat our homes. There will be more homes built if this current housing bubble is any indication. Uh, stopping the building of uh, those, th those, uh, those pipelines or those lines to our homes, et cetera, uh, could have uh, enormous short-term and, of course, long-term implications. How how do policymakers get around uh, the Gordian knot they're they're apparently uh, tying themselves into? The uh, well, there, there's two answers to that. The <clears throat> the first answer is, I'm not suggesting no more pipes. What I'm suggesting is the the gas utilities in their planning change their approach instead of trying to put as much pipe in the ground as they can which is how they grow their profits they should be planning to put as little as they can that's the first thing and the second thing is there's no reason why every time there's a new house the gas utilities have to say oh there's a new customer let's hook them up that's not what happens everywhere else in the world that happens here and we've allowed it to happen. Indeed, it's a cheap way to heat your house. But what happens in New York? There's, there's uh, transmission constraints, and as a result, there's lots of areas of New York where if you have a new house, sorry, you don't get gas. It doesn't matter. There's no gas to give you. So there's no reason why that has to be the answer. And in fact, if we don't have uh, gas ready, ready made on the spot every time, what will happen is other solutions will come in that in the long term are better anyway. Other people want to comment on that? I mean, from a youth perspective, I think paradigms are shifting. It's not realistic for most young Canadians to think that they could afford a full freestanding home, um, especially where the market is. 
And so I think the electrification of future homes, um, living in condos, living in houses, houses, these are all things that are very much on the radar of young Canadians as they're, as they're shaping their lives because the way the market is going at the moment, um, it's not necessarily an option and it's no longer necessary to have a gas stove or have a gas heater and people are willing to look beyond that. I think the industrial consumers is where we can really be talking about the future uses of gas, um, where we really need it, but in the home, we've seen that that's not necessary anymore. And, and so, you know, there are current consumers and we're not saying that they can't have gas anymore, but when you're looking to future generations and future consumption, the paradigm is shifting rapidly as to what it is that the next layer of consumers want. If I may, if I may add my two cents. So uh, we, one, of, one of my nightmares is, indeed, we will be the last people on the, <laughs> on the gas system. And should that be our reality, then we won't survive because uh, our competition isn't the next municipality. If you're bringing iron ore or bringing nickel out of the ground and transforming it into something usable, your competition is in China, the Congo, uh, and if our cost structure, these are energy intensive items, they gain commodity, not high margin, if we were the only people on the system, the, the economics would be uh, phenomenally uh, uncompetitive and would, would put a question mark over our whole industrial base. I share, uh, share Jay's concern that standard assets are really a topic we should be speaking about. I think we're in a transition. I think we need to kind of look at uh, if it's not home heating, I don't know, uh, by the way, nobody take my perspectives on home heating seriously. I, 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 I may know what I'm talking about when I speak about industrial consumption, but not home heating. But from listening to everybody else, I don't know if home heating is viable into 50 years from now. Making fertilizers probably still is. Uh, making steel probably still is. Not probably, definitely still is required. But we need to look at the transition from now to that future in a manner that will keep our industry alive as we transition, keep the utility shareholders happy and not put the cost burden on, on everybody else. I have for my sins been participating in regulatory proceedings at the OEB, at the Regie and at the CER. And we're reasonably okay and effective in these forums. But these are not constructed in a manner to induce collaboration. They have been designed for a specific purpose. We're trying to use them for a different purpose. And I, I desperately feel we need more opportunities to actually talk about uh, the topics that we need to talk about outside of the confines of a very limited regulatory hearing. So happy to be here but we need to be doing more of this and more substantially. I'm not sure if it was an accident, but I want to thank Enbridge for sending me my energy bill. I just got it a few minutes ago. <laughs> the timing couldn't be any better. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I want, I, I take the Melanie, points. that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. Well done. Uh, but I wanted to uh, simply point out, I, I have a cousin in, in New York. We had a discussion about a week and a half ago, and he couldn't believe the cost of energy. And of course, I also, being from Ontario, understand what it's like to have, and I have a bill here, don't if I can find it, I won't show it to you, but in 2008, when I was paying five cents a kilowatt hour, I'm now paying 17 plus to keep the lights on, as it were, keep the house warm. I'm not sure if the electricity move is going to be at all viable, given that we continue down this road of making our energy options that much less affordable. And so I don't have an answer to that, but I can certainly suggest that in all of these discussions that uh, our opinion leaders and uh, policymakers are having, it's very rare that we actually take into consideration the fulsome impact this is going to have on consumers, not just in 10 years from now, but right now, immediately. The number of people I'm getting on Twitter uh, saying that they cannot afford, their bills are starting to come in, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly alarming, folks, and I think we have to sober up and be focused on that uh, as a, not just a small part, but the main part of any policy decisions we make going forward. Well, Dan, that raises an interesting point, which I think is, is throughout this whole discussion. And that is 
we all and the utilities all assume that this is all being driven by policymakers. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure that's true. I think it's actually being driven, as Meredith has said, by changed perceptions and as the generations move on, younger generations simply have a different view of what's okay with them. And so I, I think what's happening here is not that policymakers are going to drive us to a low carbon economy. I think consumers will. Consumers will insist. And as they insist, we'll have to respond. Can I add to that? Younger consumers are taking a more holistic view of the energy system. They're taking a view of what they want for their whole lives and applying it to every product. And so that does apply to natural gas. That applies to the housing they're pursuing. That applies, um, you know, and they're looking at they're looking at energy justice. They're looking at even the pollution within homes. They're looking at all kinds of different things. And so those are all factors in and what they are demanding from politicians is a longer time frame in how we're making decisions. It's making decisions that are setting us up for 23, that are setting us up for 2050. And so the short-sightedness on exactly what the rate is without looking at where did that rate come from, or is that a regulatory issue, or could we be providing subsidies to low-income homes, all those different types of things are what young people want to see. They don't want to just see a policy that's made for tomorrow when they need to live in Canada well beyond that. And I I'm wondering though, Meredith, on that point, uh, whether our younger generation, which you've so eloquently have described, uh, understand uh, full well the implications of not being able to make ends meet. I mean, a country that's seen billions of dollars leave the energy sector. They absolutely do. Young yeah, people and, are and how they're going to afford right now. I have one job posting out for a job that honestly doesn't pay that well, and we have yeah. 300 applicants in three days. Mm -hmm. Like, the young people are desperate right now in Canada. That's what I'm, but they don't want to be in this situation forever. And I think so how, that's how do they pay? How would they pay for an increase in electricity rates to achieve net zero? How would they get the jobs to be able to pay for those things down the road when there's an actual abandonment of investments within Canada? I'm not saying this to be argumentative, please don't take it that way. Yeah. But I'm understanding this point of, I understand where young people are coming from. I was once young myself, but if my parents can't make ends meet and I can't afford my tuition and the government's without money to pay for social programs for the things that I want and need, we're all in a bit of a problem. That, prob that, that issue is coming much more dramatically to a head because we've done a lot to dis to suppress and diminish our energy sector look what happened in bc just and I mean, electricity costs are a very serious thing but so so is the opportunity of energy efficiency so is the opportunity of building better housing um so on a personal level there's lots of ways to deal with it you know i i live in a one bedroom apartment that's incredibly energy efficient i spend 50 dollars every two months on my electricity and so and that's obviously not the case for everyone in canada but there are more systems level solutions on those types of things i think where young people's heads at is really what um, you know, we've been talking about on the industrial side as well. They're interested in the Canadian economy and how the Canadian economy can continue to lead. Um, and, and really thinking about, for especially for gas usage, how do we provide for heavy industry? How do we provide for those things that we can't substitute? I don't see it really being a conversation about the residential market in the same way. It's a conversation about where the whole Canadian economy is going. Because what young people are excited about in the residential market is energy efficiency, is thinking well, up new creative solutions, not necessarily just day-to-day -day no. electricity prices. Granted, but the removal of fossil fuels, especially natural gas, uh, and the adamacy behind that towards that goal uh, leads to a, a rather uh, you know, a sorrowful outcome, I think, for many of us in the sense that not only will we gain revenues and share in the, uh, the prosperity with these things, which has really given us the standard living that we enjoy today, it's likely to lead to a next generation that will be even more destitute and 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 without options. Uh, electricity, uh, you know, through not through uh, renewables in my province of Ontario cannot be had, and I think California, Texas, prove that without natural gas backup. So yes, industrial use is one thing, but I think I mean, we have climate change stands to make a very interesting economic impact on Canada, and so I think young people are looking far beyond just renewable energy, and also. I think that young people are maybe getting a bad rap from folks like yourself in thinking that they just want 100% renewable energy tomorrow. Nobody thinks that that's necessarily possible, but why they're advocating for it and why they're advocating for decarbonization is that 
they want a long-term plan and vision. An energy system takes a long time to change. And so if we don't start now, if we don't start talking about what that looks like now, we <laughs> won't get there. I, I want to challenge a, an underlying assumption here. Uh, which I think you have, Dan, and I think other people have as well. I'm looking at a report called Net Zero Europe. It came out a month or two ago. Um, it's by McKinsey and Company, who are not noted environmentalists. Um, and here's their key messages. Number one, I'm reading it. Europe can reach net zero emissions at net zero cost. In fact, what they say is that the average cost of living would decline slightly for low and middle income households in a net zero 2050. So th their conclusion is it's, it's a very interesting report to read and I don't agree with everything in it, but I will tell you that even in Europe where they have a very high level of carbon use in their electricity system, they've still concluded that they can add jobs, they can, they can improve the economy, and there's no net cost to get to net zero. Well, you know, that and 50 cents will buy a, a decent cup of coffee. Maybe it won't. Uh, Germany, uh, Britain, France, not so much France, uh, are heading towards uh, what looks like a showdown between industry and consumers who cannot afford. Uh, Germany is increasing its fleet of coal. Uh, they're, of course, getting Gazprom to send them that much more energy. Britain abandoned the idea of carbon taxes because they know that this would saddle people in a way that no one else would. So I, I appreciate these reports. But I think when they're placed under closer scrutiny, and I see a lot of these reports often published by governments to be self-serving, uh, to uh, reinforce their message, I think it's pie in the sky. We don't have an understanding of what net zero is, Jay, and I, that's why I'm very concerned that we're in Canada, one of the cleanest countries when it comes to energy production. We can't achieve today's goal, much less 2030 and, or even go out to 2050. So it's nice to have these plans. But I think they're really uh, bordering on the surrealistic. And that, as much as we should be going that way, we all want to do what's right by the environment. I think at the end of the day, we have to look at who's putting these this kind of information out for every one of every one of those pieces of research. There's a counter research that's out there. I'm shocked that one would suggest Europe is somehow can achieve this when currently Germany and uh, the Merkel government is teetering. Uh, Mercedes Benz is prepared to leave that country because of the high cost of electricity brought about by the so-called green energy towards that net zero, uh, net zero 2050. And Mercedes-Benz Mercedes has also decided that in 15 years they won't sell uh, internal combustion vehicles. They'll be penalized for doing it. Uh, being an old... Uh, yeah, well, old, they, I, in, I, I'm not going to assume and that... Toyota, and Toyota won't. Toyota won't go that road. No, uh, so. It depends on the company and it depends, of course, on, on, the, uh, on the conditions. We know, for instance, that uh, in the United States, 12 states have been able to manage to ensure that Tesla is, does, does very well in terms of its shares. It's not because it's selling cars that people want, notwithstanding the massive subsidies we give them. It's because they're able to get regulators and politicians to move in a certain direction. And I think the same thing is happening with companies that are saying, all right, at the end of the day, and this is really important, Jay, it's no problem. We'll go along with this as long as you, the consumer, are prepared to pay for it. And I think all the constituencies, young and old, realize we can't afford to do this. Not in Canada, nowhere, anywhere in the world. And that's why we're likely to lose people or send our industry out, outside of this country uh, where, of course, jobs will never happen here in Canada. That's my concern. All right. So I'm going to just jump in for a minute, uh, folks. Just a minute, please. I know this is a good conversation, but I want to kind of get another poll question out there. So I'm looking to uh, the audience to actually do a bit of a poll now. Is net zero by 2050 the right target? In light of the conversations you've had so far, I'm looking to see if you can actually uh, vote on that. So I'm uh, looking for your votes. So go ahead. Wow, there's lots of no's out there. <laughs> All right. Okay, Tyson, I think it's okay to actually close the poll. I think the majority is definitely uh, three quarters of it is, uh, well, I'm almost 50-50 actually. It's kind of looking like 50-50, but uh, more, more no than yes. Um, maybe a couple of questions for our panelists. I know that uh, we had some, we had one question in the system, but I'm just going to put two things out to you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left or so that uh, I'd like to maybe ask a few things. So what do you think needs to be done by consumers and industry in the next 10, 20, and 30 years that will foster a net zero carbon outcome? Or the other question that you might want to ponder is what are the economic and social strategies that uh, both consumers and industry should consider to get to net carbon uh, zero? So over to any of you, so go ahead. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I go back to emphasizing that at least for heavy industry, this file or the imperative to decarbonize is shifting from being a regulatory push to becoming a market pull. It is still not quite a market pull, but it's getting there. So we're getting, uh, and wonderful things happen when people can find markets for their goods by demonstrating some quality that they have. This is something that the engineers that work in these companies with large footprint, large facilities, managing large investments can get their teeth into and move with. Just want to share with you a couple of examples. In Quebec, we have a joint venture between Rio Tinto, Tesla, I think a coffee maker and, and Apple um, to make a zero carbon aluminum. The driver certainly hasn't come from the heavy industrial producer. It's the high margin, uh, low energy intensity folks who are demanding because that's the commitment they've made to their customers, this low carbon product, and you get a heavy industry investing in it. We have um, in the province of Quebec again, a very interesting experiment going on with um, using hydrogen and steel making. Um, and the, one of the steel plants in Quebec is probably the least emitting of steel uh, fleet anywhere in the world because it's a very young plant. It's barely 15 years old, so its technology is already much more efficient than many owned by the same parent company who owns facilities all over the world. But they are experimenting with hydrogen. I know other people who are very seriously looking at uh, carbon sequestration in their in their facilities. I know uh, we have uh, a lot of interest in seeing carbon intensity of various gaseous blends. Uh, certified, identified. So as this moves from a regulatory push to a market pull, the economics will change. We are at the cusp of a change. The economics are hard today. The transition is going to be critical because it is a very much a one, two step game to keep, to make sure we remain alive as we transition. But if we manage to transition, we have a lot of things going on for Canada. We have the resources. We have cleaner power than most. If we can get our act together and become this powerhouse for low commodity, low carbon or no carbon resources, this is a phenomenal economic opportunity. So um, I, I look forward to see not only governments pushing the levers that they have for regulations, governments have a whole bunch of other levers. They have got procurement levers. They look at international standards. It's time those things were exercised. They're not expensive. They don't increase cost and they may reduce cost for Canadians if played strategically and pressed upon strategically. I wonder if I could add a short story on um, on the the drivers of the change. Um, as some of you know, I represent the schools in the province of Ontario, and I was at a meeting the other day, a virtual meeting, um, in which a bunch of people working in schools are trying to. They're talking about how do we get our schools to be no longer using fossil fuels at some point in the future, and, they, and how quickly can we do it? And um, they were talking about what the government wants them to do and all that sort of stuff. And one person said, and everybody agreed with them, no, 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 that's not why we do it. We do it because our students are asking us, why are we not, why are we to heat our buildings? Why are we doing that? And sooner or later, we have to answer, no, we're not doing that anymore. So, sorry, who else? <laughs> You know, I thought we were an energy powerhouse in this country, um, you know, and I understand the idea of, uh, and the idea of back and forth. I, you know, there isn't a single thing that I'm familiar with, unless we're talking biofuels uh, and biomass, where we are not using fossil fuels in one way or another. And 
uh, uh, Jay, sorry about the Mercedes thing, but I was a Toyota guy for many years and uh, helped launch <laughs> the first car in North America that you might, we, we know today is the Prius, but when I had launched it in 91, uh, it, as uh, uh, public relations for that company, it was known as the Tsunami. We changed the name because of, of course, its implications. I think technology will be there, but I think we have to be careful not to rush it. Uh, I know that there are many who are concerned about trying to bend the law of physics to achieve a certain goal. I think we have to have a plan. Uh, and I think uh, we, we, we can't punish, us or punish ourselves to try to achieve that goal if we happen to fall short. The fact is I think we have to be pragmatic and we have to be realistic about those goals to ensure that we have everybody on board. Uh, I appreciate, Jay, what you're saying regarding the schools. Uh, my kids attend school as well and it's almost uniformly one-sided in terms of, you know, let's deal with the hydrocarbon issue uh, to the exclusion of all others while completely ignoring the importance of hydrocarbons and their central role, not just in our prosperity, but our ability to use that, harness it more efficiently as, uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, Shahzad has suggested, to the ends that I think we all want. But we don't do that by throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And I think at that stage, let's let technology develop. Let's get those better engines. I mean, we don't hear today about uh, cars having, uh, you know, pollution problems in the way that we did 20 and 30 years ago. We have achieved clean air in this country. And let's keep in mind the cost benefit analysis in anything that we're doing. Whether you're a regulator or a politician, it seems that's the last thing that's considered. Unfortunately, as we saw the clean fuel standard, thankfully not applying to, uh, to, uh, to, to natural gas or to gases. We saw a government quite prepared to you know, go ahead with a tax, and a punitive tax, which a province like Newfoundland, the poorest of regions of the country, saying this is going to do undue damage to consumers. So I think we need to look before we leap and uh, celebrate fossil fuels because they brought us the prosperity we have today and they can be really resourced and harnessed responsibly going forward. So there's a couple of questions in the uh, chat line. Maybe I can just uh, go ahead and ask a few of them. So uh, a question from uh, the Senate of Canada. So I'm interested in where, uh, whether Dan's affordability concerns include consideration of climate change impacts and uncertainty as well as ongoing fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, for example, the 321, uh, 320 million uh, that was just provided uh, for the offshore oil and gas industry. Dan? Well, look, if someone is suggesting that uh, the federal government or other governments uh, or corporations shouldn't be allowed to receive similar tax treatments uh, as any other organization in this country, uh, then I think that would be uh, the wrong approach. Uh, I do note the amount of massive subsidies given to renewables, uh, most of which uh, are really, uh, <laughs> and I say so as a liberal from years ago, I know some of those folks that got rich very quickly. I think we have to be very careful when we try to pull out information and suggest that it serves our narrative to say that gas and oil are bad at a time when uh, you know our hospitals and our educators all rely on a very strong system to ensure our pensions and the viability of our social programs, but also the viability of our standard of living. I guess uh, the initial concern I think that everyone has here is uh, what does one believe on climate? Climate is changing. I have no doubt in my mind and I do, I do know there are variations out there. But I don't think I'm a, a climate catastrophist either. And I think we have to separate those who say, well, you know, I've been around long enough. I heard the Al Gore's telling me years ago where we were going to wind up. I heard David Suzuki making the same kind of comments about the Arctic, which this morning I understand, according to Environment Canada, is 27% ice flow, greater ice cover than there was uh, this time last year. I think that the discipline involved in climate analysis is sophisticated, certainly well beyond my pay grade. But until uh, one is prepared to involve the, the, uh, the scientific method in their conclusions, I think we have to be very careful not to get and infuse too much politics in our scientific, scientific discoveries. I would Dan, so another question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Meredith. No, that's, I would just, I would push back on that a little bit in that, you know, every country that has had successful transitions like look at the Silicon Valley, all of these things are based in policy decisions where there was an investment made by government in research and development. And so I think there's nothing, you know, Canada has greatly benefited from our hydrocarbon industry. No one's saying it's going anywhere anytime soon. Net zero doesn't even necessarily mean that hydrocarbons go away. But what it does mean is that we're setting a goal as a country to be climate safe and climate responsible. And so I think we do have to take into account the the impacts climate change is having on people 
you know, it's already responsible for 150,000 deaths worldwide annually. And so we do need to be responsible as Canadians about how are we using our hydrocarbon resources and what is the future going to look like? And are we using hydrocarbons in a way that's actually necessary for the product or are we just, um, you know, are we just pursuing this um, just because we can, because we can't have enough foresight. Canada is a smart country. We invest lots in R&D. And so I think we do have to be more diligent in our policy and making sure that we're actually setting those targets and hitting them. Um, and, and it's not necessarily about one subsidy over another, but it is about um, having some strategic foresight because these are 50 year investments in, in different industrial facilities. You know, you can't flippantly say, oh, we're only going to do what's cheapest tomorrow. Meredith, your point is, is well taken, uh, and I think you're correct. We do have to have a long-term plan, but I think we also have to make sure that the data and the information, such as what you just provided, is in fact accurate. 150,000 deaths, or you know that, uh, uh, that we'll be under 10 feet of water in, in, in a period of time, or that uh, other, you know, what I consider hyperbolic rather than scientific, rather than foundational oh, issues. The WHO. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. I think it's important to understand that we, we need to be able to have two sides of the same story. Right now, it's been very one-sided. In my time, uh, and I, I don't want to keep going back to it, I'm, I'm amazed at how much uh, there, the discourse has changed in the past 10 years to be almost universally, uh, you know, one makes it an assumption and it's suddenly uh, considered to be fact without debate. Uh, I think we have to be more open and, uh, and challenge ourselves to be honest and be truthful about information that we're receiving and not certainly morph that into policies that will be ultimately damaging, not just to the truth, but to consumers as well. No, but Dan, Dan it, it Surely in this conversation, it doesn't matter whether climate change is real or not. You and I can disagree on that. What matters is whether the public at large believes it's real. Because if they do, if the public, and particularly the younger public, believe that they need to use less fossil fuels, that's going to be our future. It doesn't matter whether they're right or wrong. It matters what they believe. Jay, when they don't have a job, when they can't afford their utility bills, and when the bailiff comes to their door, uh, they do have that question. And I see a lot of people in Alberta right. in that situation right now. Uh, no, uh, look, this is a re this is realistic. We are looking at uh, if you, I gave you the information at the beginning of uh, MNP's information. Fifty three percent of Canadians say that they are one month away, two hundred dollars away at the end of the month from insolvency. Those are not laughing matters. If you look at the fact of that, it's not a question of distrusting the information. They aren't laughing when, matters. When reality comes to knock on your door. There's a lot of other things that are adding up other than people's energy like, bills. Like and, and Dan, keep in mind, that's been true for 50 years. It's not new. We've had we've had an economic we have we have had economic prosperity likes which we haven't seen for many years. Low interest rates, Jay, uh, high employment. Uh, universal uh, programs that have been supported financially in large part by our agriculture, mining, and of course the energy sector, all of those are now at risk. And we could be looking at a scenario in one year from now where all this debate that we're having about what it'll look like in 2050 will be of no, of no consequences. More and more people join the lines of those who are extremely distrustful of governments, distrustful of information, and more importantly, broke. Okay, so gentlemen and ladies, I will have to interrupt. I'm sorry, we're overdue for time by one minute, but I want to thank the panelists because this was a good, uh, heartworthy uh, debate. I think there's lots of good conversation that still can be held, but for now, I'd like to thank the panelists and the audience for being part of the conversation today, and I'd like to turn it back over to uh, Monica to uh, close out. So thanks, everyone, for cutting you off, but I had no time. The timing had to, had to be done. Sorry. Thanks, Diane. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the moderator and the panelists for participating in this important discussion. I think uh, it's easy to see that it was a very lively discussion. It was also very candid and, and frank, uh, and it raised so many pivotal issues and challenges uh, that will need to be addressed in the years ahead. These are precisely the sorts of tough conversations that I believe we need to have. Uh, in this country, and this panel showed that it can be done uh, respectfully, positively, uh, with a view to moving the needle. Uh, so I wanted to thank all the panelists for that because I know these conversations can be challenging, but they're precisely the ones we really need to start to have uh, in this country.
So this moves us to our closing segment, actions and next steps. Uh, there were multiple themes that were raised throughout the day. And I just wanted to share three in particular that stand out uh, for me. Uh, the first deals with the role of rate regulated utilities. I think they you know, can, can be perceived as obstacles to reducing emissions. But I think we saw today that they are motivated and would like to play a positive role in the years ahead. Um, but what I'm beginning to see too is that we need to reframe how we think about them. You know, this is not a homogeneous group of utilities dr delivering traditional natural gas products. Uh, increasingly, it's about a diverse group of companies offering new products, new sources, and new services like renewable natural gas, uh, compressed natural gas, combined heat and power, hydrogen, uh, LNG efficiency, leveraging existing infrastructure for new purposes, and on and on. Uh, you know, as we saw, there will be multiple pathways and key strategic choices to make. It will be crucial uh, to zero in on the areas where utilities can play the greatest role. And this is likely to be a company by company, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, sector by sector set of choices informed by integrated both and approaches. We heard that expression a few times that solve for multiple imperatives. So not just climate imperatives, but also security, affordability, safety. You know, these really aren't binary either or choices. We need to get into a systems thinking uh, mindset. I think importantly, we also saw that young people and consumers want to be a part of this and have expectations, uh, but we can't undercut energy security and affordability in the process of reducing emissions. Somehow we need to figure out how to align and develop integrated approaches. The second theme to me deals with how to facilitate utilities playing a positive role, how to remove obstacles, how to provide incentives to amplify good work. I think there were a number of obstacles that were raised today at the policy level, at the regulatory level, within industry itself, uh, and also obstacles at the political level. I think we saw that in the previous session, you know, differing public perceptions about the role of natural gas and more broadly of hydrocarbons in the country's energy future. We're really going to need to have some frank and candid and robust discussions on these issues, uh, and we'll need robust cost benefit analyses and planning in the long term to address them. We really need that integrated both and systems thinking rather than either or thinking. I think we saw a number of examples today as well of how to facilitate utilities playing a positive role, both here in Canada uh, and abroad. And, you know, my view is that we're in a process of unprecedented experimentation on these issues. And we're going to have to learn and learn fast what works and what doesn't. Uh, and that's where this workshop is so important. The third theme that I saw coming through deals with decision making and key areas to reform decision making. I think we saw today that reforms to unlock the potential of rate regulated utilities to contribute to Canada's 2050 ambitions go well beyond tinkering with the system. This can extend all the way to reforming utilities legislation, to reforming regulators mandates and processes, to transforming organizational culture and practices, to new models of collaboration across the entire energy system, to reframing how we think about what a utility is and what it does. But, the, but these reforms really need to be informed. We need to think about how the energy system and how the various parts of it fit together. The policy parts, the legislative parts, the regulatory parts, the imperatives we've been talking about today, affordability, reliability, sustainability, safety. There's no shortage uh, of work to do. So as I mentioned at the outset of the session, this is the first in a series of conversations about the role of rate regulated utilities on the road to 2050. The immediate next step is to draft a report based on the workshop. Uh, this is going to be more than a summary report. It's going to identify recommendations for action based on our discussions today, including the roles and responsibilities of various players in the sector and key action items in the short and long term. The report's going to be made visible to a broad audience, including those who are in attendance here today. And based on the report over the next number of months, a work plan will be developed for the next few years. Uh, the CGA is going to share that with you and we'll invite you to take part in the second session in the fall. We hope you can join us then. Uh, so stay tuned. There is much more to come. Uh, this brings us to the end of the workshop for today. I would like to thank all of the presenters for their insightful presentations and remarks. Thanks to our moderators as well for their excellent uh, facilitation of our discussions. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you attendees for your participation, for your questions, for your comments. It was a very rich discussion. 
Uh, so with this, I'm going to close it off. Have yourselves a lovely afternoon, and uh, we will see you very soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.